Chantise Gonzalez bringing you the latest edition of The 70, a program that shows you what's going on around the ship and takes you deeper into the lives of some of your fellow shipmates. And now, let's take a look at what's going on around the deck plates. As the saying goes, you choose your rate, you choose your fate. In our first story, Petty Officer James Guthrie follows some of your fellow sailors to see what it's really like to live a day in their boots. Here is a day in the life of an aviation bosun's mate, Fuel. From the depths of the ship's interior, running all the way up to the flight deck. One thing ties everything together, JP-5. ABFs are responsible for fueling the aircrafts aboard and making sure that the fuel that we rely on every day is perfectly mixed and ready to burn. Every day as an ABF, I can tell you, it's gonna be strenuous some days. You're gonna be tired, uh, maybe not get enough sleep. Maybe some days you get too much sleep. You just gotta know your job. Like we, we pull out, we hook up, we make sure that we get the, the bird fuel, then that is ready to go. More than just the day-to-day -day tasks, there's a certain camaraderie that exists in the ABF's world. Most important part of my job, I have to say, is uh, it's the family. More of, more of anything else, more of the work, more of the money, it's the family. Um, a lot of us guys up here, we're real close, you know what I mean? We go out to eat when we're in port, and uh, when we're out to sea, it's just like you can't, you can't ask for anything else but to work with your family, you know? So 12 hours, whether it's 12 hours, 14 hours, whether it's 24 hours, it's still a family and, and that, that's what gets us through the days better. This family-oriented mentality goes beyond the lower enlisted ranks. Uh, our chiefs are like our fathers, our, our third classes and second classes and petty officers are like our uncles and, and aunts. You know what I mean? So that's the best part of me. That's, that's why our rate is the best rate. Well, the ABF family works hard. Their pride for their work and the fun that they have never take a back seat. When, when you pull in a big 100 and 200 something pound hose, you pull in all the way out 100 and something feet and everybody out there watching you. So that's, that's probably my favorite part because it's like you get to show off a little bit. Because of the chaotic nature of the flight deck, anything can happen at any time. We can rest a little easier knowing that the ABFs are experts at handling, mixing and maintaining highly explosive fuels. They can and will get the job done right. Reporting for the 70, I'm Petty Officer James Guthrie. To junior sailors, out of all the ranks in the Navy, there's one that stands out among the rest. In this next story, Petty Officer Alex King has an inside look at a first class's journey to become a member of the Goat Locker. What does it take to become a Chief Petty Officer? Some might say it is a strong work ethic and technical mastery of your rate. Others might say it's the ability to inspire junior sailors to strive for excellence. Truth is, it's different for everyone. And for ABH1 Ezekiel Clifton, the journey to finding this answer has been long and hard fought. I think the most important thing, whatever rank you're at, you need to be striving to take the job of the person above you. So, like I said, you're preparing, if you're a second class, to be a first class, to take his job. What quals do I need? You know, what should I be doing to become well-rounded? Getting involved in the community, getting involved in the Junior Enlisted Association, you know, getting your name out there on a department level and a command level so that everybody knows you. ABH1's philosophy of taking on the next rank's job has definitely suited him well. But with so many different factors determining a prospective chief's ability for selection, good evals alone won't guarantee a spot in the goat locker. Well, the, the big difference for the chief exam is the final multiple is made up of your test score and your eval average, and that's it. So you don't have award points, you don't have higher education points, you don't have P&A points, you don't have any of that. So it's how well you do on the exam and then how well you've been performing your job. ABH1 took leave before the test so that he could maintain a solid studying schedule. So I'll get up in the morning, take my daughter to school, enjoy breakfast, go home, you know, pull out the flashcards or the laptop or whatever reference I'm using for that day and I'll do about an hour of studying. Then I'll go to the gym for a little bit, come home, 
watch some TV, and then I'll, you know, I'll do about another hour of studying. Uh, right before the test, a little nervous, hoping that what you prepared for is actually what's going to be on the exam because a lot of a lot of the times you can read an entire manual and they pull only one question. I feel really good about what I've done and, and you know I knew a lot of the questions and so I'm excited about the results and then I can't wait to find out. With the Chief's exam behind him and the results still pending, ABH1 continues to set an example for his sailors as he fulfills his role as Air Department V3 Division's leading Petty Officer. Reporting for the 70, I'm Petty Officer Alex King. Hi, I'm Becky from STSU, and I'm like way into military guys. I'm not Becky. I'm Kim Jump Park from North Korean Intelligence. Right now, I'm trying to figure out where your ship is. Oh my god, my friend Tammy was just there. And right now, like OMG, you're totally screwed. I like can't believe how easy it is to talk to you. And it's people like you who are ruining it for everyone. On the latest edition of Voices Around the Vinson, Petty Officer Samuel LeCain introduces us to Chief Randall Zanonian, who tells us about his Native American heritage. Randall Zanonian, Yenishye, Maitesh Gijni Nishla, Bilagana Bashishchi, Kenya Ani Dashiche, Bilagana Dashinali. During the Second World War, the United States had a desperate need to create a code the Japanese cryptographers would not be able to break. Twenty-nine Navajo men volunteered for the duty and departed to join the United States Marine Corps. These twenty-nine warriors created the only unbreakable code in modern warfare history using the Navajo language. Not only was the language extremely complex, but the syntax and tonal qualities of the language made it unintelligible to anyone without extensive exposure and training. For example, how would you write down the Navajo word, the Kachikai? You see now, the language has such different tonal qualities that it makes it very difficult for a non-native speaker to transcribe, let alone decipher and decode. In order to make the code completely unbreakable, new combinations of Navajo words were used that would not even make sense to a native Navajo speaker. Here are some examples of the actual code. The word Navy is encoded as which means sea soldier. The word aircraft carrier was encoded as which means bird carrier. The word booby trap was encoded as the nebawaglehe, which means man trap. The word tank destroyer was encoded as which means tortoise killer. The code was so valuable in war, not only for its security, but also for its speed. A Navajo code talker could accomplish in 20 seconds what it took 30 minutes to an hour or longer using a code machine of the time. 
The code saw use in every engagement in the war in the Pacific from Guadalcanal to Iwo Jima and was pivotal in ultimate victory and hastening the war's end. When the Navajo Code Talkers returned home from the war, they did so without a hero's welcome. The code was considered a secret, national secret, too valuable to divulge, and those Navajo warriors that guarded it did so silently for more than 20 years until the program was declassified. Hi, my name is Pierce P. Smith, and I got my pen thanks to Surface Warfare University. Before, you know, I never thought I'd be able to get my pen. You know, seeing that as I work all day, and it's hard to get my claws at times. Here at Surface Warfare University, students study in our state-of-the-art laboratories and get hands-on training from the industry's top professionals. Hello, I'm Professor Love from Swoo University. If you're not enrolled in East Foss University, you're like this guy running on a treadmill, going nowhere fast. You know, they make it really easy to understand. They make getting the EP a piece of cake. Four out of five Surface Warfare University graduates get promoted by their chain of command. It means more money on your cash card. It gave me the confidence I need to succeed and get out there on the deck place. I feel great. It feels like I'm finally taking control of my life and my career. Thanks, SWU. Hi, I'm Assistant Dean Johnson. Here at Swoo University, we care about the total sailor. How do I know? We are all former alumni. This program has single-handedly spearheaded our success together. Let's make dreams come true. Call JDAL 6616 to enroll now and jumpstart your career today. Don't wait. In most lines of work, people are trained to escape fires. Aboard Carl Vinson, sailors are trained to fight them. In this next story, Petty Officer Hansel Pinto spotlights a group of sailors charged with being the first to respond to shipboard casualties. Carl Vinson's ability to house and transport more than 60 aircraft and 4,500 sailors is made possible through a complex network of pipes, electrical wiring, and hydraulic systems, all of which are very flammable, making our ship vulnerable to mishaps. With all these hazards on board, it is vital for Carl Vinson to have a plan. The Flying Squad is a group of sailors who are trained to respond to a casualty on board the ship. So Flying Squad drills are designed to challenge the Flying Squad. They're the elite force that's going to show up and prevent any casualties from spreading, fire, flooding, or toxic gas. Those guys are trained to respond to those casualties. So we design training scenarios for them to um, practice on, like 
will will simulate fires. The flying squad will respond to a fire. So over the ship's announcing system, the one MC will hear the bells ring, and then the flying squad will man a repair locker, establish communications with the control center, and dispatch from that repair locker to wherever the casualty scene is. During this underway period, Carl Vinson's flying squad is training continuously in various scenarios in an effort to keep their skill level high. You run two drills, that third drill, you're dead tired. But you know, you just gotta keep it going. You know, you, just, you can't lose motivation between watch standing and you know, work maintenance that's gotta be done. You gotta make time for these drills. As challenging as participating in the flying squad may be, sailors find being part of this elite team to be rewarding. I like being on a flying squad because I know as a flying squad member, if anything does go down, the ship's counting on me to put out any type of casualty. I like that. In addition to finding value in their role, Sailors also get a rush when responding to emergencies. Hear the bells, you jump up, and whether you're dead asleep, you're you're instantly awake. You know, your adrenaline starts pumping. You know, it just it just feels good. You know, you, you feel real important when you report to those casualties, what regardless of what, what position you want in the flying squad. As the flying squad continues to train, Carl Vincent can rest assured that they will stay ready to respond to any casualty effectively and efficiently. We're going to get our qualifications and we're ready for deployment. Reporting for the 70, I'm Petty Officer Hansel Pintos. That's it for this edition of the 70. I've been your host, MC3 Shantice Gonzalez, and on behalf of the Carl Vinson Media Department, we thank you for watching.